Hello, and welcome to Informs' webinar, ChatGPT, Implications on Industry, where we will be discussing different aspects and implications of ChatGPT and generative AI. My name is Jeff Cohen. I'm the Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer at Informs, the largest association for the data and decision sciences. Informs members support organizations and governments at all levels as they work to transform data into information and information into insights that lead to better decision making and more impactful results. Today's discussion is particularly timely given the recent news that the House has set new parameters around the use of generative AI, only authorizing the paid version of Chat GPT Plus to be used by House staff. Informs' 11,000 members are comprised of diverse and robust experts in data science, analytics, operations research, and other related fields. Their work touches literally every sector and has been responsible for saving lives, saving money, and solving problems across a broad spectrum of areas, including healthcare, transportation, artificial intelligence, and so much more. Today, we are joined by an INFORMS member and leading expert in the discussion about government intervention in artificial intelligence. We'll discuss if there's any precedence and how chat GPT and generative AI is different from other disruptive technologies. Dr. Subodha Kumar is the Paul R. Anderson Professor of Statistics, Operations, and Data Science in the Fox School of Business and Management at Temple University. Thank you, Dr. Kumar, for being with us today. And before we get started, it'd be interesting to hear about the type of work and research you do around chat GPT and generative AI. And so perhaps we could start with a brief overview, Dr. Kumar. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for having me here and thank you all for joining. Um, my work on, on generative AI or chat GPT, we try to look at different angles. First of all, we try to see what are the applications that we can generate uh, or uh, create using AI. And that spans from things like healthcare, to uh, finance, uh, manufacturing, retailing, and so on. So that's the first stream of research uh, we try to study. Second, um, we look at uh, how, what has been the implications of this kind of technology. And there we try to see that what has worked, what has not worked. And uh, that helps us in generating ideas around what we need to be doing next in terms of, do we need to create new policies or even, what kind of new solutions we should be thinking about generating. Um, and finally, um, we also try to study uh, in, the, in the disruptive technologies domain things like a lot of policy changes happen uh, around blockchain, NFTs, metaverse. We try to analyze that, um, uh, that what has been the impacts of these changes, both from the company side and policymaker side and give a holistic view on that. So it's it's a very interesting um, area, I believe, which applies in all the industries. And uh, it also uh, touches almost everybody, uh, every human being in the world. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. It's, it's impact is certainly uh, profound. Uh, let's start by addressing the memo that went out to House staff on Monday regarding uh, the authorization only of the chat GPT plus program uh, uh, for staff use. What does this mean for congressional staff? Uh, what are the implications? Uh, and is this big, is this regulation in particular uh, in the best interest of those on Capitol Hill? So, uh, you know, first of all, let's make sure we understand the reason why uh, this memo went out was because this uh, chat GPT plus comes with additional uh, uh, security and privacy features, right? So the idea was that when we put the data in there, we are not really uh, compromising the data and it is not going in wrong hands. Now, this is, uh, I, I'm both happy to see that this happened. And second, I'm not surprised uh, that this happened. Now, there's a reason behind it. Such things are mostly good, especially because we are still trying to understand the implications. And in the past also, uh, we have seen these kind of things, especially when people started putting things on social media. And I would rather say that we were very late in creating these kind of policies 
uh, in the past and we have seen the implications. One very good example was that uh, when Cambridge Analytica data scandal happened. This could have been avoided if we had good uh, controls in places. Now, in that scandal, those who are aware, you know, many people put their personal data on social media, Facebook um, at that time. And then um, this was used or misused by companies for different purposes, including for political purposes and so on, right? Now, the, the proper regulations or policies by different organizations would have helped. So we, we will see a lot of these things actually happening in medical sector, because that's where a lot of sensitive data goes. Uh, financial sector, there again, a lot of data. And also uh, the, the Congress putting this kind of thing. So it's mostly good. Uh, of course, it creates some limitations on how it can be used, but unless we have very good understanding of what data is generating, where it is going, and where it's being used, we need to have such kind of thing. So mostly it is for good of everybody, I will say, uh, for the staffer as well. I appreciate uh, that that insight. I'm sure our audience does too, as we understand the guardrails that are that are sometimes constructed. And along those lines, you know, ChatGPT is viewed by some as a major threat, and others see it as a as a major opportunity. And not just ChatGPT, but generative AI uh, uh, at large. But can you talk about uh, on on a macro basis where the benefits and risks are where it comes to platforms like ChatGPT? No, so see, first of all, we have to understand the generative AI, uh, unlike some other uh, earlier solutions. Uh, touches everybody. It touches individual users. It touches small businesses. It touches large businesses. Uh, it even touches things like hospitals and, and um, uh, government agencies. And let me talk about some of the examples so that we can really perceive what is going on. Uh, like individual users can use generative AI or chat GPT to draft an email. Right? I have some ideas, put your bullet points and they will draft an email which you can edit, creating reports. Um, even, you know, Jeff could have used this interview questions uh, created using chat GPT. In fact, uh, interestingly, when Microsoft invested in chat GPT, one of the early interviews by that was done by Wall Street Journal analyst Joanna Stern, and she showed that how she created uh, initial draft of interview questions using chat GPT to ask Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, about chat GPT, which was interesting. But we will see. These are the things. When we think on the business level, uh, they are creating solutions like customer service and support. For example, you want to provide multilingual support, but you don't have staff. You know, generative AI is great for that. Uh, how to create social media content, which is a big question. A lot of my research evolves around that, that how you can generate content uh, for different platforms and how often to post. Generative AI can help you in creating content that you have not even thought about. Right. So get all the data and work on that. Uh, similarly, customer analysis. But I see that a lot of new solutions that earlier disruptive technologies could not touch is innovation side. See, innovation is always an area where we say that human need to get involved and technologies cannot have. Generative AI is getting into that as well. Like new drug discovery. Uh, we are using already pharmaceutical companies are using generative AI. What new features to put in the product? new product design, or even contract design, right? So clearly there are a lot of good business solutions are coming. So we need to be careful on putting too much control because we need to use it. But the challenges side is the one of the biggest challenges with generative AI is that it learns from users input, which is a great thing, but it is also a bad thing. Because if the input is bad, then it can create wrong results. For example, one of the most classic case has been where chat GPT started hallucinating, which means it created references that did not exist. Why did it do that and how did it do that? Because it was connecting different pieces. So it will put Jeff's name, uh, put my paper and put uh, a journal name, which we both don't even know, right? And then you get a reference that does not exist. It also created URL links that did not exist, right? So I think the problem here is that it is great, but the wrong input can lead you in wrong direction. So how to control that? I think that is the key. So the real guardrail should be around how the results are created, 
how the created results are tested against accuracy, and what is the accountability. I think those are the things that we need to worry about it right now. Otherwise, uh, it's a great thing. I, I appreciate that. And, and part of what you've described has been uh, an age old problem in, in, in analytics, right? That uh, many of our uh, colleagues talk about garbage in, garbage out, and yeah. making sure that the, that the high quality is preserved uh, yeah. uh, throughout the ecosystem. Uh, Dr. Kumar, the Senate recently held a hearing with the founder of ChatGPT who called for more regulation around AI. How do you view the broader regulatory landscape for AI? And what would your counsel be to policymakers and their staff from a regulatory standpoint? You know, it's very interesting. Actually, founder of C, uh, C, uh, the founder of ChatGPT, in fact, he also went to other countries, including India, met with Indian prime minister, uh, met with, uh, and there was a hearing for him. And he has been pushing, or he has been at least expressing uh, uh, his point of view on there should be more regulations. So, so you will say that why is this guy who has created this would want more regulations? In fact, it is in the interest of chat GPT that these regulations make sure that positive parts come out and negative part is controlled. Uh, otherwise, they have to do it themselves, right? So actually, it's, it's in, in his interest and in the interest of the society to do that. So there's a reason behind it. Don't think that just being altruistic actually is, is very good for everybody, right? Now, uh, there was a bill introduced on June 20th. Uh, it was a bipartisan group of legislators. Uh, uh, they introduced this bill on how to regulate AI. And uh, they are the, if, you, if you go and the most important piece in the bill was that two things, they say, mitigate the risk and harms of AI and protect the US uh, leadership in AI innovation and the opportunities such innovations may bring, right? So very clear. We want to protect uh, our citizens. And in fact, the uh, Indian government came out with a, with a statement saying, we want to protect our digital citizens. European Union, a uh, couple of weeks back, they came with the uh, uh, AI Act, right? Again, the similar point, we want to protect our citizens, but also we want to make sure that the innovations are happening. So everybody is on the same page, which is good. Similarly, China is also on the same page. Uh, and what we are all saying is the thing that I was pointing out earlier is about how do we make sure that the results that are being created are created in the right way and people are not using it in a wrong way. Now, how to make that happen is still unclear, or I will say complex, right? So how can I say that, you know, let's make these applications commonplace, but still people uh, are not misled by that. Uh, and writing those regulations are not going to be easy. We are talking about it, which is a very good start. But how do I make sure that people don't go and search for, do I have cancer? And it will give you some result. But they are 94% correct, but there's a 6% chance of wrong, which can have fatal uh, implications, right? So how to make that happen will only happen if uh, these policies are pushing the companies hard to create more accuracy and uh, the transparency in the result, how it is generated, and there is some accountability in the process. Once that happens, I think we'll be fine. And every country will try to do that. And my uh, guess at this point will be that they are all learned from each other. So once European Union has a bill, US is looking closely at that. China is looking closely. And, and I think US and European Union will try to take a lead on making these bills and then the others will follow. But all of those things will emerge in next few months. We are going to see some very interesting things. Um, uh, and uh, hopefully we all do the right thing at the end of the day. That's the that's the hope at least from both researcher side and policymaker side. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. I, I'm gonna call a, a little bit of an audible, uh, Dr. Kumar, we had uh, in a question pop up in the chat. Yeah, um, sure. uh, is there a concern over scenarios where AI performs well, but is used for abusive purposes, such as police camera profiling, stock market manipulation, unfair gerrymandering, map design, uh, you know, things of that nature? Do uh, you care to address that? Yeah, yeah. See, don't think that uh, this has not happened. It, actually, those all the examples that you mentioned is has been happening before generative AI. 
right? And I'll give you one example, which is one of the project we, we have been working with Philadelphia City, is that uh, you know social media sometimes in Facebook uh, or Meta now and uh, Twitter they allow you to customize your ads, which is very good. You can use AI to to bring your ad, but then for renting purposes, the the lenders may sometimes or or the the homeowners may sometimes create ad in such a way that it is profiled against certain. Uh, group. Right? Now, those kind of things, AI is very good in doing that, and that will happen. That's where I feel, you know, there's no easy solution. If you want AI to do all of these things for us, they can be used for good purposes, and then it can also be used for bad purposes. How we can prevent the negative side is, uh, or how we can minimize the negative side is that by having proper controls in places, and second, Keep eliminating those things as they emerge. So we have to be, uh, the policymakers have to be ahead of the game. And also these companies have to act responsibly on their side. And there should be regulations so that they act responsibly. Some of the latest social media regula uh, the hearings and uh, uh, the decisions have been around that social media companies have to behave responsibly, not just uh, legally, right? I think... We need to have the, all these bills we are talking need to have more of that. But don't think it will not happen. There will be negative uses, but we have to work together to minimize that. But this is bound to happen, unfortunately. Uh, there's no easy solution out there. So, you know, there, there are literally tens of thousands of, of innovations within AI, if not more. And chat GPT, which we talking a lot about today happens happens to be the one that has really caught the attention of the American public. Is AI innovation outpacing our ability to learn about and where appropriate regulate its future? I will say yes and no. Uh, and, and why I'm saying that, see, it is almost impossible to find regulations before the solutions or technology are developed. The reason is that, you know, a lot of technological innovations are happening and some of them die down. They don't even see the light of uh, actual implementation. So how do we write regulations around that that's not going to happen? So there will always be a catch up. Um, and uh, the, the implications are also very hard to predict in advance. Um, when, when internet uh, or World Wide Web came in 90s, we did not know that the something like social media will come. In fact, Social media idea was frowned upon even until 2003, four. Uh, in my class, I had got uh, some very senior people involved with this MySpace and all. And everybody felt that why would anybody use social media and put personal picture for public uses, right? So that idea everybody thought would fail. Now, how can we write regulations when we think the idea is going to fail? So there will always be catch up. The only thing we can do here or we can urge our policymakers to do uh, is that uh, pay very close attention. And sometimes it is not a bad idea to do things like sending memo that happen using only chat GPT plus. It is not a bad thing to happen. In fact, we need to be a little bit aggressive on that um, so that, and we can always relax it later, right? Once we realize that, no, no, we don't need to have this kind of regulations, we can relax. So they need to be both proactive and very dynamic. If we are doing that, we are okay, but there will always be catch up. But we need to be extremely proactive and dynamic and change with the situation. If we don't do that, then we are in trouble. Uh, but at the same time, I will add one more thing. Uh, Knee-jerk reaction is also bad. If we, if we try to curb everything, that's not going to work. We should only be put it in a way that it can be used, but at the same time, uh, we are careful that it is not misused. That's what will happen. And that I hope that's what happens on the policymaker side. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, Dr. Kumar, we had another uh, you know, question that, that came in. It's, it's a little bit long, so I'm going to try to paraphrase it. And whoever asked it is welcome to follow up with us on email as well. But, but the, the question in essence is that we're spending a lot of time talking about regulating AI um, and, and minimizing uh, risk and so on and so forth. Uh, but the, the person who asked the question points out that we haven't spent much time in public dialogue anyways, talking about um, well, what happens when such 
uh, regulations are violated from a, from a penalty you know, perspective, you know, whether those are uh, monetary fines or civil or criminal, whatever it may, may be. So how do uh, we ensure that anybody who were to violate the regulations around AI uh, don't get a free pass? Um, an interesting question, certainly worthy of, of more conversation off offline, uh, but uh, you, you want to take a quick jump? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll tell that. So, so let's be clear here. When we say regulations, these regulations are being discussed to include those penalty, by the way, right? So when we talk about the uh, AI law that European Union is bringing or what US is contemplating or India, actually one of the key aspects of the whole thing is that how to... Uh, set the rules that what if this does not happen, what kind of penalty will be there? You can even lose license. And you have to understand that when Facebook was charged a hefty fine um, for by FTC for uh, after this uh, uh, scandal uh, uh, where the data Cambridge Analytica scandal, they were not charged for violating any rules. They were not charged for selling the data. They were charged for something that they could have stopped, but they did not stop. And after that, uh, Meta has signed a contract with the US government that they will, they will not only try to uh, follow the rules, but they will try to also make sure that nothing wrong happens to the users. And if something happens, they will not only pay penalty. In fact, uh, it is also being contemplated that some of the executives may have charges. So you may even see that they're going to jail some of them if they're not following. So don't think this is not happening. When we talk about regulations, regulations certainly include that. In fact, I had a, a written article a few weeks back where I got get into the detail. But the idea is that how we can, the regulations are thinking about how to publicly vet the claims of AI companies, ensure that uh, their products are regularly tested and lay the great, great, great groundwork for all the fines or any other regulatory actions which could be suspending their license or even, even putting charges, these are all part of the regulations. And that's why this is complicated to write such regulations, right? But it is, it is certainly part of that. Uh, th thank you. If you were to step back and think about where AI is today within the technology life cycle, is this an emerging technology? Uh, or is it actually more advanced and even more widely uh, you know, spread and used than, than people understand it to be? Uh, it's a very interesting question. Now, if you, if you go back and when AI started, I means I will say that we have been using AI since human being came to existence, you know, frankly speaking, because we are using some kind of intelligence. We use some kind of data um, to make things happen. And we try to use different devices to make that happen. But really, the when we think about modern AI, uh, modern AI started happening when we started think as a symbolic pattern. Um, and the initial idea happened, uh, was formally at least coined the term in 1956 uh, during the Dartmouth conference. But a lot of action happened even in 40s. Um, around modern AI. But the real world came in 1956. Uh, and since then, uh, we are always emerging. So when you say, will it, will it be emerging? AI as a field will always be emerging field. What will get matured uh, or becoming mature is the solutions. So for example, uh, 20 years back, prediction algorithms were, were emerging. Now they are mature, right? Now we see a lot of solutions around face recognition, neural net, convolutional neural net uh, and those kind of things, they are emerging. So AI as a field will always be emerging because we will keep coming up with the new solutions. But those solutions will start becoming mature and will move to the next level. Uh, we will get closer and closer to our science fiction movies um, and uh, sometimes even surpass them, right? And that's what will get matured. So when we think of AI, yes, in the technology life cycle, AI as a field will always keep developing, uh, at least in our uh, lifetime. And I guess kind of building on that, my, my last question, uh, as you're looking into your crystal ball, Professor, um, you know, how, how, more pre how much more prevalent will AI become in our personal lives, our work lives? And what might you expect the, the technology to look like five or 10 years from now? 
So first of all, we need to understand that uh, it is becoming more and more commonplace uh, than we even realize it, right? There was a, uh, there was a survey uh, sometime back where the users were asked that whether they have interacted with AI. And uh, the people, like 84% of that group had some AI-based solution that they had used, but only 34% told they have actually interacted with AI. So what it means, 50% of the people don't even realize that they are utilizing AI, right? Now, this is, this is very important and profound. So when we say that will AI will be a commonplace, it's already a commonplace. Uh, it's already into the part of our life. How do we think that um, uh, our emails are put into spam, right? Or how do we think Google gives such nice answers for us? Well, this is all AI. AI is already there. Uh, but we are going to see are more and more so going on the life. For example, you go to a doctor, some of the initial screening might be done by the AI. We will see more of these kind of solutions coming. Uh, your financial um, management, a lot of these things will be done through AI. Um, and then later on, the experts took over, right? So we will see a lot of such solutions coming. When you say that how much prevalent it will be, it is already there, it will be even more. Uh, more and more so of basics and repetitive tasks will be done by AI. In next five to 10 years, we will see a lot more. But where we will see the changes is that the advanced things, not just the repetitive things will be done by AI. And what we call it a customized, the mass customization. That's where the AI is going. Mass customization means I will do things, the AI will be able to do things differently for Jeff than me. And it's very different, right? Uh, for example, a car can drive differently for a person than the other person. So a lot of these AI-based innovations right now are moving towards mass customization and we will see. Even then, uh, some people will not even realize AI is doing it for them. Uh, but that's what will happen. So five to 10 years down the line, uh, we will start seeing more and more so uh, examples. We will not uh, need people to check our IDs when you go to the airports or we will not, uh, most of those things will be done by facial recognition um, and so on. So we will keep seeing, and this is, as I told, it's always, it will always remain, remain an emerging field. Whatever we do, we will always keep improving on that, but it will become a lot more of our uh, uh, daily life. Uh, that's what is going to happen, Jeff. Dr. Kumar, this has been an interesting conversation. I, I, I wish we had uh, more more time uh, uh, for those uh, in, in our audience today or, or watching it later. Uh, we thank you for your time uh, and interest. If you had questions that you didn't ask or we didn't get to, please email me at jcohen at informs.org. Uh, we'll be happy to uh, make a connection and to uh, uh, help you and, and your boss uh, uh, move the ball forward in these conversations. And likewise, Informs has members working on complicated and important issues on a variety of topics. And if you are interested in learning how analytics, data science, decision science, operations research can help your efforts in creating a, a policy and evidence-based policy making, please feel free to reach out to us. Again, my email address is jcohen at informs.org. Thank you again for watching and we will see you again soon. So Jeff, there are some questions in the chat. Do we have time or we stop here? Uh, you know, what is it? Uh, well, I think we, we got to a, a couple of them, uh, Dr. Kumar. And I think uh, in the interest of time, if people would okay. reach out to us on email, sure. we will we'll get back to them and get you connected with them. Okay, sounds great. Thank Excellent. you very much, Jeff. And thank you all for attending. We'll get to all these questions. You feel free to write to Jeff and we'll be happy to answer. Great. Dr. Kumar, thank you. And to our audience again, thank you and have a great day.